Thanks for tuning back in to Vantage Swim. Today we got a big topic to tackle, a crash course on stroke development, you might say. I wanted to premise this talk with a proper introduction so we can all be on the same page. What makes swimming captivating for you? Odd request, but yes, while you're typing in the comments, the reason why we're starting here is because our answer to this question will influence how we write the rest of the program. For me, my interest is anchored on the fact Swimming is fitness expressed through form. I do love watching other sports, and I used to be an avid runner, but this keeps me coming back to swimming. There are many ways to complicate things, but only a few ways to simplify it. Tackling this challenge has kept me engaged ever since. Now, it wasn't always like this, and maybe it's not the same for you, at least not yet. See, high intensity is very marketable. So back then, swimming was a way to elicit excitement. It was a show of strength. A good coach will tell you, however, that high intensity alone is incomplete. And indeed, when we are focused on the extremes, we miss the means. Getting attracted to the excitement of short events or the exclusivity of long events can lead you into the same pitfall. Outside the swimming world, the fitness industry has figured out a counter for pitfalls like these. I'll call this the eccentric counter, which made people understand that muscle growth is a long-term adaptation to muscle damage that is caused by eccentric loading. So if muscle size is the primary interest for bodybuilding, cardiorespiratory fitness and neuromuscular proficiency are two of our long-term adaptations of interest. The role of cardio adaptation is to improve energy production, and the role of technique adaptation is to wire in the motor control aspect of swimming. So to counter this pitfall, we're gonna use a similar playbook. By explaining that swim performance is caused by long-term adaptations from these systems due to targeted stimulus. You cannot outwork poor decisions. Maxing out a small engine will still make it a small engine, and mindless distance leaves improvement to chance. With all that being said, we can now let that mindset spill through our writing process. This is the vantage point from which we will construct the rest of the program. This mind map actually starts from three simple observations. First, there's an arm motion. Second, a leg motion. And lastly, something to connect both of those actions. Now there seems to be a specific hierarchy here because strictly separating one aspect of the stroke makes the movement look unrecognizable, even if the simulation is pretty accurate. In other words, the main propulsive action cannot be functional without the base of rotation or undulation. Furthermore, the base, such as undulation in butterfly, is limited by the most basic factor of body position and feel for the water, which allows the athlete to practice an action like dolphin kicks in the first place. Now it may seem like these are too basic, but remember that we don't want to rack up unfocused mileage. Even top swimmers use drills to sharpen their stroke. So instead of jumping straight into the full stroke, we ease into it with carefully selected drills. So what are we priming for exactly? The fly kick on the back, for example, primes the core to stretch into specific pelvic positions. Repeatedly stretching into an arc is only heavily used in swimming. This skill will influence your ability to stretch out during the catch, stabilize during the pull, relax during the breath, and stabilize again during the fly portion. Similarly, the flutter kick primes your legs to constantly perform this twist and flick action. Because of its alternating nature, it becomes crucial when forming the base of a balanced rotation. Lastly, the skill of sculling essentially tests your ability to catch the water with the hands. This is especially true with breaststroke, which can be thought of as a skull powered by the chest muscles. The ability to masterfully catch the water is also essential to form the freestyle catch early in the cycle. The freestyle catch is a very popular topic, but it really comes down to how well you can catch resistance early with the hands. We'll figure out the numbers later to focus on our scaffolds first. The first working set after the warm-up would include drills that work on the base of rotation or undulation. Again, nothing is too basic, and we are still preparing for the best full-stroke execution later in the session. This part can be executed in a varied or blocked manner. When it comes to motor learning, however, varied practice is ideal, but if time and novelty are factors to be considered, blocked practice can still be an option. In this discussion, I'm more focused on running through the hows and whys of these selected drills. Mix and match can be worked out later. Building off the basics of butterfly undulation, 
We'll now flip the stroke on the stomach, which means that breathing will now be a factor in addition to undulation. The butterfly has four distinct beats. This is the idea of thinking in keyframes, which is one way to practice deliberately. In animation, movement is just an illusion of carefully constructed frames. In swimming, correct movement is a function of accurate poses. The ability to drop the hips into a stretch as the legs kick was primed earlier. This is how we achieve the ability of breathing without compensating with the hands, and the ability to land back into the water without diving too deep. In other words, this simple skill keeps the momentum moving forward by removing all unnecessary up and down motion, which is a key trait of butterfly swimming. Now what about this extra drill here? This drill will prepare the front end catch of the fly. Every time the swimmer pulses forward with the kick, there is an equal and opposite reaction from the water which forms the fly catch. This is still a base drill, so the breathing tempo should still be the same four part pattern, although the breath can now be left for the last part similar to what is usually done in the full stroke. Moving on to the flutter kick strokes, we'll take a look at freestyle rotation first. Again using the idea of keyframes, we'll put the spotlight on this pose as the base and the goal of every freestyle pull. The legs can only get here if the hips rotate, and the hands can only pierce forward if the core stabilizes. A simpler way to think of rotational slings in swimming is to simply divide the body into a pulling side found on the back of the body and a counterbalance side on the front of the body. The opposite sides have to tug on each other to maintain a tall posture. Remember that the water is a versatile environment and it will allow you to replicate movements such as this which would otherwise require special equipment on land. Currently, I am utilizing a swimming position where I flip this pose onto the back. I then perform a modified scissor kick to rotate my hips from side to side. The propulsion only occurs when I zip my legs back together. I specifically drew angles to indicate where the hips are turning. The zipper kick is labeled as a modified scissor kick because you don't really need a large range of motion like this. But you do utilize the same mechanism of splitting the legs then zipping them in to produce propulsion. The scissor kick is a skill that is supposed to be easy and functional enough for military application. So this shouldn't be impossible to modify. Modifying the kick this way prepares us for the arms in the next working set. But before we head to the pull, we'll talk about backstroke rotation, which is the second type of rotation in swimming. Again, to simplify the dynamic nature of rotational slings, we'll assign half of the backside to dip into the water while assigning the opposite front side to counterbalance. This forms the base of the backstroke twist. I want to emphasize here that we are moving away from the idea that hip drive and shoulder drive can be both used in freestyle. Cutting the propulsive phase in half is not a smart way to increase tempo for freestyle. Catching early before the hips rotate is how you increase tempo instead. Notice that the base is still the same freestyle twist described earlier, hips mobile, upper body stable. In the opposite case, where the upper body is mobile while the hips are stable, we now have a better base for backstroke that lets you achieve the shoulder roll position. We're going to dip the entire left side, not just the pinkies, while the other side will go chin to shoulder to balance the body line. So in the next drill, we're going to hold this pose and propel ourselves with a flutter kick or a scissor kick. This is our backstroke base. Now because these drills are lower body intensive, we're going to take advantage of the oddness of breaststroke to mix in some pulling. For breaststroke pulling, we're introducing a different type of core action. Core extension is only observed in breaststroke and allows for squeezing actions from the chest. Because the superficial portion of the abs get fairly stretched in this position, the swimmer needs to figure out how to brace the deep waistband muscles instead. All of these drills are naturally slow in speed because they are not the main propulsors of each stroke. The increased time spent for each lap is essentially an increase in training volume. At this point, we're starting to see how focused practice with these drills can go hand in hand with aerobic conditioning. So there we go. The base of fly is core compression. The base of free and back is rotation. And the base of breaststroke is core extension. With that, we've effectively hit all the foundational core movements. The goal of an IM-based program is to smoothly mix all of these together. But think of it as a database from which you can mix and match drills in a smart way. Awareness of the bigger picture is your advantage.
Let's now head to our main propulsion drills. When it comes to butterfly pulling, relying on scapular movement is the key. Observe how my shoulder blades are squeezing into each other as I pull. Our focus therefore is to add one pull into an already existent skill of timing. Every down kick is a chance to stretch and relax, while every up kick is a chance to power through the pull or to fly during the recovery. Red indicates when to compress the core during transition movements such as pulling or flying, and green indicates a small window in which the swimmer can stretch either during the catch or during the breath. The one arm fly highlights the need to stretch before the pull and the need to relax on the breath before performing a quick recovery. Adjustments to technique are encouraged in this drill since the energy demand is lower compared to the full stroke. We're going to continue this scapular movement with backstroke. So instead of just skating on one side, we will now attempt to switch to the other side. This drill lets you differentiate between anchoring and transitioning. This is an anchor kick. To rotate on the left side, the left leg has to anchor and its pair, the right leg, simply has to prepare. This is a transition kick. There is no intention to switch the rotation, just an intention to zip the legs together. Think of it again as a scissor kick but with better streamlining from the legs. This is a repeat of the first skating position. We are now primed to anchor with the right leg as soon as we decide to zip the legs again. The rotation will be continued until you get to your skating position. Hold that position by zipping the legs together. Split the legs again, then anchor the rotation to the left. Again, aiming to quickly get back to the skating position. In other words, we start with a split to anchor the rotation, zip the legs together, in transition, split them again, then switch. We start by holding the anchor position by splitting the legs. Most programs would rather indirectly target the skill, but learning how to connect the rotation with the kick is a very useful skill for both backstroke and freestyle. The second thing that the switch drill teaches is the alternation of the arms. As one arm falls, the other arm rises. The scapula on the pulling arm is just going through a resisted falling motion. Notice the same squeezing of the shoulder blade. Meanwhile, the other side is just racing overhead. For the recovering arm, notice the spread of the scapula on the elevated arm. The ability to spread the scapula overhead and the ability to squeeze the scapula on the way down is a common theme in fly and back. Don't worry about internalizing all of this info at once because swim notes can be found on our website for your reference. Let's now move on to freestyle one arm pulling this time. Recall that our goal is always this freestyle twist position. Transitioning into that position is what produces propulsion. Here's where we start to differentiate from fly and back. A freestyle like pull pattern comes from the shoulder, which means that we are focused on tucking the elbow tightly into the ribs. In contrast, a fly like pattern comes from the scapula, which is focused on drawing the shoulder blade into the spine. It helps that we've sneaked in isolated breaststroke pulling earlier, which teaches the swimmer to rely on muscles that attach to the shoulder. The chest and the lats are two of the major muscles that are connected to the shoulder. The action of elbow tucking is an example of a movement at the shoulder. Because we have primed the skill of sculling and rotation earlier, we can afford to simplify the explanation of this drill. Catch the water, then power through by tucking the elbows to the ribs, then recover toward a biceps to ear position. Nothing can be perfect the first time around, but stacking the drills in a strategic way saves us from the ordeal of cramming all the different cues together. What we're trying to drill in this stage is the ability to stretch the pulling muscles by aiming for a bicep to ear position and the ability to pull on this tension by tucking the elbows to the ribs. This is very different from the goal of spreading and squeezing the scapula in fly and back. If base drills target mostly the core and the legs, Main propulsion drills target the core and upper body, but once again our exception will be the breaststroke. I'll just briefly mention here that going on the back is the perfect way to pattern a hip extension movement like the glute bridge. A more detailed explanation is in the essential series. These drills are still meant to have a relatively low energy demand to allow for more focus. Only in the next group do we start to transition to higher heart rates as the stroke gets closer to full execution. As we get closer to automatic execution, these drills will test if you can still produce quality execution with less queuing. So let's go ahead to the single double fly drill. This is a drill that builds on the previous skills by adding the double arm stroke of the butterfly. 
This drill is a chance to incorporate the overhead portion of the butterfly. The recovery portion of the fly has to be treated as an active portion of the stroke because of a higher need to resist the downward pull of gravity. This is why the fly portion coincides with the upkick, which is our landmark for the active phases of the stroke. So the only focus of this drill is to teach how the recovery mixes in with the other skills. Correct undulation, low breathing, correct catching, and correct pulling have already been primed in the previous skills. These skills don't improve overnight, so the aim of every session is to be incrementally better at all of these skills so that the cumulative effect of each improvement can manifest in the full stroke. The full stroke is where we expect the execution to be automatic. Because all of the skills are being displayed at once, everything blends into something that can only be perceived as rhythm. This is why a large portion of training is dedicated to isolating the fundamentals because the full stroke is naturally prone to breakdown due to many moving parts. For backstroke, skating on one side or pausing before switching is a way to allow the swimmer to be conscious of each movement. This time, the two-beat backstroke tests the swimmer's ability to smoothly transition from base to base. Achieving the base position and switching to opposite sides have been introduced earlier. So it's a matter of testing if the swimmer can dip and switch in a smooth cycle. For the breaststroke, it helps that we can practice the kick and pull separately in the previous sets. This drill therefore works on the undulation aspect of breaststroke. Our essential series talks about this in more detail. For the freestyle, engaging with alternating arm strokes does not occur until late into our diagram. The goal here is to simply practice how propulsion is generated as we move from one side to the other. Still consistent with the idea that as we get closer to the full stroke, we transition from a focused execution to an automatic execution. For long axis strokes, two beat kicking is a test for the swimmer's ability to connect the arms and the legs through the core. The concept of rhythm should start creeping in during this portion. Every kick is like a drum beat that initiates the rotation. Performing the full kick cycle, therefore, is just about sneaking in the transition kicks. Transition kicks are there to provide stability. For freestyle, Transition kicks keep you in the rotated position. And for the backstroke, transition kicks hold the hips in place while the upper body drives the rotation. Again, because all of the elements are now blending in, the stroke can now only be described as a rhythm. For freestyle, you'll perceive the anchor beat followed by two transition beats. Again, the anchor beat followed by two transition beats. For backstroke, after getting to the base position, you'll perceive one anchor kick and one transition kick before getting back to the base position again on the other side. Now what about this extra category here? This category is reserved for maxing out intensity. Although I rarely use these, I made it a point to include it in the diagram to point out that the ability to sprint is still connected to the rest of the skills. A common theme for sprinting is catching early. Catching early restarts the cycle quicker for a higher stroke rate. That may sound too simple, but that's because the number of cues you can properly absorb in this part is very limited. What you see as the full stroke is the result of long-term adaptations. This is the deliberate practice solution, long-term adaptations in the shortest amount of time. In the next couple months, I will be working on improving the way you improve, so subscribe to stay updated with Vantage Swim.